Okay, welcome to the official closing ceremony of East Berlin. First and foremost, of course, hackers, we love you. Thank you so much for being here. That was really just so beautiful. I already get the goosebumps thinking about it. I saw so many people hacking through the night yesterday and uh, you have maybe also seen us because we made a round through the house and tried to cheer you up. I hope you liked that. Um, so we can confirm that at, I think, 1.30, there were definitely more than 100 people up there still hacking, which is awesome. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for making our weekend super special. And with that, we dive into the actual Closing ceremony. Right, so um, we prepared a couple of items for this closing ceremony. And um, first and foremost, I want to mention this. Um, and I think we need to emphasize this. Uh, we can't emphasize this enough. Um, the P Department of Decentralization, who is organizing events like East Berlin, is first and foremost a non profit collective um, with only voluntary contributors. None of us is employed or gets money for doing this. So. Um, this is really important to understand when visiting events like this and also hopefully please respect uh, us as, as, as people spending our free time here. Um, the, we operate as um, roughly uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a very open collective go governed by uh, rough consensus and we are mainly funded through donations, grants and sponsorships. Um, besides East Berlin we do, so we do events which um, is probably one of our more visible uh, aspects, events like East Berlin and Protocol Berg, but also we have uh, decentralized infrastructure initiatives like in the previous years, the, the Gurley testnet was very visible too, and also we do blockchain art. Um, if you are interested to contribute, this is often a question we get, um, the best way to engage with us is to just um, physically join us to our um, regular meetings. We have a regular meeting in German, it's called Stammtisch um, at the C-Base hackerspace um, every third Wednesday of the month. And this is open and please. And you can find the date also on the C-Base website in the yeah. calendar. Yeah, so let's look at ETH Berlin. What went down here this weekend? We had 802 humans being checked in. I want to say there were probably a few more here and there because I don't think everybody got scanned or maybe a few people sneaked in, but that's obviously completely fine. But just for the breakdown, out of these 800 plus people and probably 20-ish dogs, I don't know how many dogs you counted, uh, we had 220 seven hackers in the house, a really good ratio in my opinion, uh, 56 wonderful volunteers, 40 experienced hosts who hopefully made your weekend really special throughout through providing a lot of really nice spaces, drinks, uh, experiences, etc. Uh, 33 judges uh, whom some of them we will also see on the stage later today, 18 mentors who hopefully helped you a lot with your questions and pro projects in general, um, 15 core team members, which you will also see later, and 13 speakers. I think it was even 15. Maybe we didn't count correctly. So uh, today uh, at 11.30 or 11.40 for the submission deadline, um, we counted 83 submissions in total. And um, we are once again really blown away by not only the quality, but also the amount of submissions we saw. We had for the track uh, submissions freedom to transact 14, 18 infrastructure projects, uh, 19 defensive tooling submissions, and 25 for social technologies. Uh, for the excellence awards, it's a bit asymmetric. Uh, <laughs> nine projects went for the best smart contract. 27 for best user experience and 43 for best social impact. So um, that's a really interesting alignment here uh, and I'm really happy to um, see all these projects. And lastly, our new experiments this year, the Meta Award, we had seen eight incredible submissions. Yeah, also more on that later. Thank you all for submitting your projects. Um, now. <laughs> Before we move towards the actual winners, there's something that we need your help with, and that is voting on the hacker's favorite. 
So this year we have the setup a little bit differently to two years ago, but I think you will all be smart enough to get around this. Basically, um, you will need to have a Zupas profile in order to vote on the hacker's favorite. And I'm saying this right now because you all, please, need to get your phone or laptop out right now and create a Zupas profile in case you haven't done so yet. I highly doubt that that's many people who are still missing because you needed your Zupas profile to log into the submissions portal and you also needed it to claim the um, ETH in the faucets. But anyways, if you haven't done it yet, please do it now. Visit zupas.org, use your ETH Berlin ticket email to create a profile and then the voting will happen later today on zupol.org. And the poll will be launched during this closing ceremony, so make sure to create the profile now because uh, you need to be included in the semaphore group in order to be eligible to vote. And if you don't have a profile set up now, you won't be eligible later. The poll will be open for one week, so you have plenty of time to look at the projects after this hackathon. Maybe first take a day off and nap and uh, then catch up on some sleep and then check the projects out later. And the poll closes on the 3rd of June, that's next week, Monday, at 4.20, obviously. And all the voting info and links will also be in the hacker manual after the closing ceremony. All right, and before we announce the winners for all the different tracks, we want to do um, a small session here on stage and invite Vitalik Buttel. A special guest on stage. The side <laughs> Please join us and welcome Vitalik. Okay, yeah, well, first of all, Vitalik, thank you so much for being here. I think I speak for all of us here in the room um, when I say that, yeah, it's super awesome to have you. Um, Berlin is always very excited to have you. And it's probably a very special moment for many people here who hacked all night through. So welcome. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's so good to be back in Berlin. Yeah. Talking about Berlin, that is a very good first point. Um, we want to use this interview to basically uh, touch on yeah, topics of our manifesto, but also since we're in Berlin, walking down uh, the memory line a little bit and yeah, talk about stuff from the past which uh, you may have fond memories of uh, or not, let's see. <laughs> but my first question would be, um, what are your favorite Ethereum moments that happened in Berlin and do you have any personal connection to the city? I mean, I've, I feel like I've uh, been here like many, many times over the, lo uh, over the last, um, I guess, 10 years now, I think. Uh, things that I still remember well is definitely yeah, myself, uh, Gavin, uh, Gavin and uh, Jeff uh, hacker housing together in our old office in uh, 37 Waldemarstrasse and uh, hack, uh, coding up uh, POC9, uh, which would then uh, you know, like end up uh, being the Olympic test net and uh, like just working together over the course of two or three days and like fixing uh, all of the bugs uh, before I had to head off to Switzerland and they um, all had to head back to where they are. Um, I, th I yeah, definitely still remember that, still remember the uh, Ethereum launch uh, here, of course, the, yeah, then, uh, you know, I was also here for the uh, Ethereum uh, merge uh, as well. I, uh, I mean, I was unfortunately, uh, I, w I, I was uh, sick that day and I didn't want to infect people. And so I kind of waved at the uh, ETH dev office from outside. But, uh, you know, it was still uh, lovely to you know, like be here as well. No, you know, it's, uh, there have just been, you know, a series of, uh, just a really uh, amazing, I mean, Ethereum events, but also just uh, Ethereum communities and um, you know, Ethereum people that have uh, been here for a long time. This is uh, you know, one of the, uh, one of the um, places where the Ethereum Foundation has, uh, the mo has the most people and has uh, had the most people for a long time. And I'm always uh, really grateful every time I come back. Cool. Yeah, and uh, in case you guys didn't know, Berlin is also the place where DEF CON Zero happened, so the very first mm. DEF CON in history. Um, what do you remember about that? <clears throat> it happened, uh, you know, again in... Uh, 
I, 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 I try, it just gets like, okay, I, uh, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll try anyway. Um, it, I think, yeah, uh, I mean, it was still, I mean, like at the, in that same office uh, where we, yeah, later ended up coding POC9 and uh, launching uh, Ethereum from, you know, this uh, fourth floor of a fairly unassuming building. And uh, there were only about like 45 people there. Um, so, you know, first uh, DEF CON was the smallest DEF CON. And, um, you know, like everyone just uh, properly came together for the first time. Um, you know, people presented CPP Ethereum, Go Ethereum, all of the different projects from the research team. Um, you know, Jill Lubin, uh, who uh, uh, eventually yeah, moved on to start Consensus, uh, was there the whole time. Um, so it was just like a really nice uh, you know, like opportunity for all of the people who are building Ethereum right at the beginning to um, actually yeah, just get together and, and uh, see each other and share ideas. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. crazy to think about like mm -hmm. 40 people at DEF CON uh, here in mm -hmm. DEF CON Zero and now I want to say 7,000 in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So the, the space has grown quite a bit and you mentioned that uh, yeah, the community is very important. I want to say that Berlin has a quite strong um, crypto and Ethereum focused community. Uh, what would you say, which role or what role does the community play for Ethereum? So. One of the things that I notice about Berlin, and I think this uh, stretches um, out even beyond Ethereum, is like the city definitely has this like really strong and deep political culture. Like people really care about values here in uh, a way yeah, that's like greater than uh, a lot of other cities. And uh, like I don't even look at, look at this for uh, like not even just in Ethereum. Like if you just uh, look at all of the different ads on the street, I even uh, made a point of just uh, photoing them because there's like so many of them right now. Um, you know, people talking about uh, you know being a, a strong together with uh, Europe. I'm um, you know freedom. Uh, a lot of, um, people That's because we have the elections coming course, up, yeah. A lot of people supporting uh, supporting Palestine, which uh, of course uh, makes sense. Um, this one is, uh, uh, th there's like really fun ones. There's this uh, one, uh, 180 Grad Ziel nicht überschreiten. So do not step over the goal of 180 degrees. And you have like a, a pizza that looks like the earth. So it's like a you know, pretty fun joke about climate change. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. It's, uh, you know, like, pe like people care and uh, like it's clearly genuine and, um, you know, at the same time as uh, caring, people are actually willing to have fun. That's, I mean, well, even the world coin ads are fun here. <laughs> <laughs> they do have their ads up everywhere, that's true. So that's, yeah, so it's, uh, and, and this is just like things that I see just like walking around here over the course of uh, the last few days and it's like a pattern that I've seen over uh, over and over again, right? And uh, I think uh, very similar ideals get uh, reflected in the uh, Ethereum culture here, right? It's, uh, you know, the, this has uh, never been the, uh, the center of uh, going into Ethereum to make money. Um, this has, uh, you know, never been the, uh, you know, the center of uh, getting into Ethereum in order to try to dominate the world or, um, you know, like launch your own token uh, for the sake of launching a token or, you know, like any of those things. Uh, like there's been uh, a very deep um, open source culture here. And uh, I mean, I even remember Gavin, one of our co-founders, uh, he, uh, the perspective that he brought um, to Ethereum and uh, like the perspective that I think a lot of the developers that he found, um, you know, here and uh, also uh, brought is basically yeah, looking at Ethereum, not just as being like Bitcoin plus smart contracts, but looking at it as being open source programs that can have a memory, right? And uh, like that's uh, it's a really fascinating shift in perspective. And like if you really think about it, like it's a really valuable run, right? Because uh, like I think we can all kind of understand the story here, right? That uh, if you you know how was the original you know free software movement born? Um, you know at the beginning all software was free because like hey yeah you know you write something and it's really cool and you should share it. And then people like Bill Gates um, you know started making it proprietary and putting it behind copyrights and uh, even trying to put it behind patents. And then people like Richard Stallman got upset and they said, like, no, um, you know, you should be able to do things on your computer with uh, software. And uh, 
you know, if you're working with tools, you should be able to like pick apart those tools and like change them and make them what you want and like see what's going on inside and uh, like redistribute them and make your own things on top, right? And uh, then that vision, like, you know, we say open source succeeded, but then at the same time, what happened was that there was this shift from like mostly local computing to like mostly computing on uh, like, uh, you know, first we had Microsoft Word, then, okay, you know, we had OpenOffice, which became LibreOffice, and, uh, you know, that's better than Microsoft Word because it's uh, open. But then you have Google Docs, and Google Docs is, like, way less open than, like, even Microsoft Word was. Like, with Microsoft Word, at least it creates files that are on your computer. There isn't, like, a national intelligence agency that sees them automatically. Um, you know, you can even, I mean, like, go uh, and uh, try to reverse engineer how the files work, and like you know, open office actually managed to do that and like you know how does google docs work it's like okay you know everything goes off into a cloud and like you know like servers like somewhere in america and like i'm not even sure where right and uh, the reason why it has to be this way is because people start started caring about collaboration right and people started caring about um, you know things like not just like me editing a document for myself but like people working together on a yeah, documents right and the and then you ask like how do you translate the ideals of free software onto a world where like we software just has to be networked in order to fulfill people's needs, right? And so the vision is basically like, okay, you have to have a shared memory and like maybe Ethereum can be that shared memory, right? So like that was the, web, the original Web3 vision. And of course, I think, uh, you know, the original Ethereum ended up uh, not uh, delivering back then, uh, basically because, uh, you know, there were the three pieces, Ethereum, Whisper, and Swarm. And uh, on Ethereum, the fees were too high. Um, you know, you're nobody. You know, who here wants to use uh, a version of uh, um, you know Google Docs that is free and open TM? But every time you make an edit, you have to pay a dollar and thirty-three cents. <laughs> okay, so like, and then you know we had Whisper and uh, Swarm, but those uh, ended up uh, you know. T taking uh, oh, no, a really long time to get developed and then, I mean, I, but then since then, of course, I mean, we've actually had some progress on this, right? You know, we've actually, yeah, Ethereum is cheap again, thanks to layer twos. Blobs are actually succeeding. Um, you know, then uh, Whisper, I mean, it uh, ended up turning into Waku and like Waku is like actually out there. Like I think, uh, I think Railgun actually uses it under the hood, I believe. Um, so it's, uh, and then, you know, we have IPFS and like the pieces are actually coming together, right? So like there is a vision where now that the technology is actually there, there's like these piece, these uh, older ideas and pieces that I think we can, you know, remine and uh, revisit. But like the culture, um, you know, here is like one that like actually really uh, values those things. And um, I think uh, like I've always been, um, you know, grateful to especially, especially the Berlin part of our community for just like keeping those aspects and those ideas inside of Ethereum alive. Speaking about values, Vitalik, um, mm. in um, around 2017, 2018, I remember when the mm. Parity Multisig was hacked, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of initiatives going on trying mm. to like solve this, you know, like trying mm. to figure out the governance, how to solve like non-technical problems. Mm. And um, we all were kind of distracted, you know, we got together in, in Toronto for EIP0, mm. and we all were kind of trying to figure out how to solve these problems. But then at some point on the side, just as a side product, we realized we had all we coming from different backgrounds, from different geographic locations, mm -hmm. and we all um, don't necessarily have the same understanding what Ethereum is or what Ethereum values are. What, what, in your opinion, are Ethereum values? Mm. I mean, I think there is a yeah, core that strongly motivates people, and uh, like one of the yeah, sen sentences that I yeah, sometimes use is like trying to build uh, a free yeah, and open internet that is uh, at the same time trustworthy. And uh, I think uh, like that cap captures a big chunk of what makes blockchains unique compared to both centralized systems, um, but and um, also a lot of other projects that are trying to be decentralized, but that uh, are not, um, you know, like using things like blockchains and zero knowledge proofs, for example. So I think uh, you know there is a, a yeah, solid core um, around that, um, and but uh, at the same time, like there's 
a lot of different um, you know groups that have a lot of different emphasis right and uh, you know we have people here that are working on community currencies um, we uh, have people elsewhere that are working on uh, a very different type of uh, decentralized financial markets there's uh, you know people um, like uh, Gitcoin who um, you know like have their own view of uh, you know, like what it means for the crypto space to support the commons um, then you know we have uh, other groups I mean even uh, you know like groups like uh, I mean like circles and breadchain for example that I uh, mean you know, like, you know like have some of their own takes of uh, what things like that might mean so I think uh, there's definitely uh, you know, some level of alignment, but at the same time, there are all of these uh, different uh, offshoots uh, that have somewhat uh, d somewhat different approaches. And I actually think that's healthy, right? I think uh, one of uh, Ethereum's strengths as a community, right, is something that like we sometimes get criticized for a lot, which is like, oh, you know, Bitcoin has a simple narrative; it's digital gold, and like that kind of like papers over the fact that like actually you know there was like you know digital gold and uh, the uh, uh, like internet cash thing and digital gold ended up winning but like you know digital gold is like this one dominant thing and that's it but like in ethereum it's like whoa like what the heck is ethereum and uh, you know okay you know like sorry you know ethereum is uh, less blackrock friendly than some people would like but uh, <laughs> at the same time like i think it's uh, like it uh, it really, uh, the strength is basically that like we are able to like actually, uh, you know, like massively paralyze and uh, like at the same time, like actually, uh, you know, like deliver on like the, the best version of uh, a bunch of uh, these different approaches that we can. And uh, like in that process, I mean, sometimes, um, you know, we discover like what, what things actually work better, what makes sense to do, what doesn't make sense to do, and you know, like what kinds of uh, ideas it makes sense to combine together and what ideas to rally around. And like, I think that's a good thing. Um, at East Berlin, we um, always hmm. try to hmm. um, emphasize a lot on values and we try hmm. also to make our part to define these values. And hmm. what we usually do is we, try to open the door a bit for our hackers to mm -hmm. um, to learn more about these values by writing our manifesto. You know, we write, write a manifesto where we reference local or global trends and po polit political events, uh, but also reference uh, maybe what's going on in the crypto scene. And just about when we were uh, about to uh, publish it, this earlier this year, you you published uh, your own blog post, uh, "Make Ethereum Cyberpunk Again," mm. which uh, caught us a little bit off guard. Um, mm. what, what is it about, and what what prompted you to write this? I'm curious. Mm. I think I mean one of the things that I've been thinking about over the last couple of years is basically kind of going back to this big question of like, how do we actually make uh, if like all of the work that we're doing inside of Ethereum relevant in the context of a world that's uh, changing very quickly, where you know you have uh, other kinds of technologies that are advancing quickly. Yeah, I mean, you know, world politics is changing quickly. AI is um, happening. Um, you have. Uh, all of these uh, different things happening, and uh, you know, at the same time, there's uh, you know, in Ethereum always this uh, big uh, challenge, right, where a lot of people just uh, like often lo do lack this kind of understanding of like what even is uh, a thing that uh, it makes sense for the uh, Ethereum ecosystem to be building for. And like, I felt that there was uh, a lack of uh, just. Uh, a simple post that like tries to articulate, I mean, like what is a vision that I think uh, really yeah, makes sense to strive toward, and that at the same time is like really yeah, updated for all of the things that have happened, uh, you know, like socially and uh, t and technologically over the last ten years, right? So, one of the things that I yeah, did in the post is like I have that uh, big, uh, you know, like two-column table, right, where I talk about like you know 2010s Ethereum and uh, 2020s Ethereum, and one of the yeah, big uh, kind of updates that I tried to like really push there is like, hey guys, zero knowledge proofs are like actually incredibly game-changing, right? And like I've said before, like I consider zero-knowledge proofs to be as important as blockchains, right? And I think uh, 
the reason why I say this is basically because um, you know, we talk about uh, like what we do as being a trust technology, but then if you ask the question of like, what are trust problems that people actually have, a lot of the time the trust problem isn't like, you know, hey, yeah, are these people going to edit the database in the wrong way? The trust problem is like, hey, you know, are they going to you know, like spy on me? Are they going to just like grab all of this data and like, you know, train on it or you know, y y use it against me in some way? And uh, like zero knowledge proofs do actually yeah, I mean, like solve this whole other set of uh, trust problems. And at the same time, they basically compensate for blockchain's two biggest weaknesses, right? Like blockchains give you an open global audit trail, they give you permissionlessness, they give you censorship resistance, they give you really important things at the cost of two very big things. One is privacy, one is scalability. What are the two things that ZK Snarks give you? They give you privacy and they give you scalability. Um, so, but then, Oh, so that's like one of the piece from the technology side, but then there's also a piece from the yeah, application side, right? And uh, if you look at the yeah, original Ethereum white paper, um, you know, it had a lot of these different uh, suggestions for like things that people could do. Like, hey, you know, you can build a DAO, you know, you can build a, yeah, a, a token swap, um, you know, you can build a, a prediction market, you can build an insurance system, right? You can build a stable coin. And uh, people did end up building um, quite a few of those things, but uh, at the same time, like it felt like, uh, yeah, the, like I felt a need for some kind, of, like an update to that in the sense of like you know here is a uh, coherent thing that the that the ecosystem as a whole could uh, really yeah, be working towards. And like, what does it even mean to, to have all of the different pieces that people are working on really yeah, try to actually fit together, right? And uh, you know, basically, yeah, you know, the core um, point that I tried to make is like, we actually do have the tools today to like build out this uh, entire tech stack that basically yeah, competes with traditional centralized tech at every level, right? So you know, we have um, we have money, we have DeFi, we yeah, increasingly have identity yeah, and um, like attestation related primitives. We have uh, some uh, pretty good governance technology. Um, you know, we, uh, we have a domain name system. We uh, have some protocols that are the beginnings of some kind of, uh, some kind of encrypted messaging. We have uh, tools that we can add on top to try to make the, uh, to try to solve the problem of, uh, you know, for example, if you're using an encrypted messenger, how do you actually trust the uh, the key of the person you're talking to? And uh, you know, we actually have all of these pieces, and there is like this extra you know, like value that comes like where when you actually try to put these pieces together, and like there is a yeah, coherent thing that you can make where the sum really becomes much greater than the parts, and the possibility of uh, like actually yeah, working toward and making that is uh, something that I thought is. Uh, like there would be a lot of value in making queer and just like point out that you know this is something possible and uh, this uh, is something where there is uh, a lot of value in uh, tr in trying to build toward it and uh, you know, like I think uh, these are also things where um, you know you don't need to like personally uh, you know like understands the details of uh, you know like polynomial math and uh, arithmetization to kind of you know see the value of the package and it's uh, like and I feel like I've talked about the different parts of the package in different contexts but it's like uniquely uh, valuable to like actually just uh, like talk about that package as a package and uh, like talk about what, what that package is and what it does and uh, you know what, and what value it provides and uh, like hopefully yeah, I mean, look, we actually yeah, are going to continue to make progress and like actually yeah, you know keep uh, build, building out more parts of it over the next year or two yeah so um, Afri touched on this already. Our topic this year is identity crisis, mm -hmm. and it was basically a two-fold theme. Mm -hmm. We had the high-level identity crisis in terms of Ethereum values, back to the roots, what do we actually want to achieve here, but also really tangibly, um, mm -hmm. what do we do with identities in the blockchain space? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Do you think we can figure out decentralized identities uh, in the blockchain space hmm. without feeding governments, uh, or corporates, or mm. other evil entities with our precious data. 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's really good that you're, you know, we're having the conversation. I think, uh, you know, we've been kind of overdue for uh, a rethink on the yeah, identity topic for a while. And I think the reason is that like 10 to 20 years ago, the mentality is basically that, uh, you know, freedom comes from the fact that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And there's like, you know, like totally zero, um, you know, like anonymity of uh, any kind. And uh, the closer you get to that ideal, the better. But then uh, the challenge in the 2020s is basically that uh, if you're a yeah, completely yeah, like unattached anon and uh, like there's no other information about you except for your content then you're indistinguishable from like tens of millions of bots that might all be controlled by the same corporation or government right and uh, so it's not just like a simple sort of like tug where, you know, the bad guys want like more name name things and we want fewer name things. It's like actually a pretty yeah, challenging battle. And uh, it's uh, like it's not like the challenge isn't just in, you know, opposing and opposing hard enough. The challenge is in like actually yeah, figuring out like what is the, yeah, the positive direction that we're trying to move towards. And uh, I th the way that uh, I, I think about this is that uh, you know, like having ID some kind of identity primitives and reputation primitives is a, uh, a very valuable thing. And it's like something you have to have because you have to somehow distinguish yourself from 10 million bots that are all controlled by the same company. Um, but uh, at the same time, you know, we do not want this uh, thing to you know, become a vector of power that can be yeah, used over um, against all of us. And so one of the ways that I think about this is like having zero metrics is really bad because then you can't distinguish yourself from the bots. Having one metric is really bad because then that one metric becomes the social credit score. And um, you know, like whoever controls the rules of that uh, basically yeah, controls everything. And the least bad solution seems to be to go in the other direction and say, like, we, yeah, you know, we need to have many metrics, right? And um, you know, there, yeah, like there should, should not be one single kind of master system that basically says, uh, you know, are you a yeah, trustworthy human or are you not, right? And, uh, like the system needs to naturally yeah, incorporate a lot of different metrics um, in such a way that it even uh, accepts disagreements from uh, di between different people about like which uh, which of those metrics are worth focusing on, right? And creating that ecosystem, I think, is something that Ethereum has kind of started to do implicitly, right? Like we've started to have popes, we've uh, started to have, uh, you know, the ver various kinds of attestations. We have the Ethereum attestation service. We've been starting to, you know, like have zoo stamps and um, you know, like various uh, zk-related things, and like it feels like we're at the beginning of uh, something that, you know, like that that feels like it's uh, going somewhere, but like at the same time, we definitely need to like really be yeah, vigilant and see like you know what is it that this uh, thing is actually going towards. And I mean, like one answer that I have to how to do that is to like actually think about concrete issues, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, when you're writing code, you have unit tests, and, like, I think uh, one of the best ways to sanity check a political ideology or a uh, political movement or project is to do unit tests, right? It's, uh, like, uh, you know, like, 10 or 20 years ago, um, you know, like, well, I think uh, a lot of people here were on, like, internet libertarian forums, and, like, you know, you discuss things like, oh, you know, if you're flying a, uh, a helicopter, you know, drunk without a license, like maybe there's a threshold at which you're imposing enough risk on other innocent people that that actually counts as aggression, right? And like this gets into these like philosophical debates, but then like the specific example like actually shows, I um, mean, you know, like the limits of uh, you know, like applying a particular principle, right? And so here, I um, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it's like actually great that we uh, have people talking about specific examples and um, you know, including the, being willing to talk about specific uh, examples that are political because um, you know, I think uh, I mean, you're never going to get um, like perfect agreements among all of them because um, you know, we're all different and um, you know, we all have uh, various uh, different ideas and different backgrounds, but uh, like it actually does help you uh, see uh, you know, like on the whole is this uh, thing that's being built something that uh, is already 
uh, moving towards uh, outcomes that are good for the kinds of causes that we care about helping. And uh, like having that kind of tight feedback loop is uh, something that uh, I think is good. And I think in general, like it's, uh, it's really good that uh, the Ethereum ecosystem is like starting to actually have this focus on real world applications. It's something that we really need to have. And uh, I think it's like, it's okay that we're making that switch only now, because uh, if you try to make an application three years ago, like the reality is that the technology was not there, right? Like, uh, you know, we've been virtue signaling about helping people in Latin America and um, Africa and, and, and so on. But like the reality is that, uh, you know, I went to, Argentina for the first time at the end of 2021. I tried to pay for a coffee, and um, you know the coffee like and people there were all you know using Binance and uh, Binance to Binance transfers are free and they're instant and like it actually works for them. I tried to you know be a proper crypto person and use the blockchain. And my yeah, transaction took like five minutes to confirm, and uh, the transaction fee cost like half as much as the coffee, right? And so, tr like, there's uh, there's a reason why I mean, you know, like things like the Bitcoin Keats, I um, mean, you know, like uh, as uh, amazing as it was in 2013, ended up uh, you know like not uh, like pr pr surviving in that decade, right? And uh, but but at the same time, like those technical problems are problems that now actually have been solved, right? Like uh, thanks to EIP fifteen fifty nine, thanks to the merge, you know, transactions actually reliably get included for me in like five to ten seconds. Like that's a real layer one UX gain that's happened only over the last three years. If you you know transaction fees on layer twos, thanks to blobs, which are you know an upgrade that happened two months ago, they're now often under one cent, right? And so problems are being solved, and like we're actually are in a position where if we actually build things uh, targeting real world usage, then uh, you know we actually can create things that people can uh, actually use and. Uh, so I think like we should really take advantage of uh, that opportunity and like really get that feedback loop started. Speaking about the technology, um, mm. and this is a question I before we wrap up. Uh, this is a question I always like asking uh, Ethereum uh, core developers, but also mm. researchers. Um, with everything you know today and everything you learned in almost ten years, um, mm. how would you build Ethereum differently today if you were able to build it from scratch mm. again? I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember I wrote, I even, I even wrote an article that like touched on some of these, but I definitely have a list. Like one, you know, um, okay, so one, screw the 256-bit VM, just like start with uh, 32 and 64, and then at the same time, like have some, uh, you know, like separate, maybe pre-compile, maybe other feature that uh, like lets you do bigger, inter bigger integers if that's what people care about. Like the original design definitely like way overfitted the 256-bit elliptic curves. Then number two, I think probably make the EVM somewhat higher level. Like there's, uh, there's no reason why uh, it need, like the thing that we should be, uh, I, I think have is uh, we shouldn't try to, like what we should have done is we should have uh, really optimized more for allowing smart contracts to really have like fewer lines of code so that people can properly see and check what's going on inside of them. Um, three, when we switched to proof of stake, we should have been willing to switch to a, uh, a yeah, somewhat crappier version of proof of stake earlier on. Like I think we ended up wasting a lot of cycles um, on uh, really trying to make proof of stake perfect and then uh, only doing the merge in 2022. When, uh, and then it turns out that like, oh, actually, yeah, you know, like even Gaspar has a whole bunch of problems and at some point we're gonna have to um, upgrade again and do single thought finality. Like we could have saved a huge amount of trees if we had uh, you know, like launched simpler proof of stake in 2018. Then uh, four, um, ETH transfers should, ha should automatically issue logs. Uh, so now there's an EIP for that, 7708, but uh, you know, it should have been in there from the beginning. Like, it, had it been in there from the beginning, it could have been like 30 minutes of coding from myself, Gavin, and Jeff. And so, instead, it's an EIP, and it has to go through all core devs, and you know, like, hopefully yeah, it'll succeed at some point. Um, then, uh, let's see, yeah. What uh, other things? I mean, this all get, this is definitely all like very yeah, you know, low level Ethereum territory. Um, five, don't do catch act, do SHA 256. Um, then six, um, like 
actually yeah, like think properly about like invariants and like basically think I mean like what are the worst case um, properties that you really care about like what are the bounds that we're trying to have because like even at the beginning we really cared about trying to make Ethereum fraud provable but we somehow completely forgot about the fact that like a worst case transaction has a fraud proof whose size is like 300 megabytes. Um, so, you know, there's like a long, long list of these uh, like various uh, technical regrets, um, though, uh, you know, I mean, I feel like uh, it's uh, inevitable for any project to like have a whole bunch of these. I mean, I think I'm just really happy that I feel like our core dev and uh, just execution capacity feels like it just keeps increasing with each passing year and we're in a position to like actually yeah, effectively yeah, and safely um, really yeah, try to uh, you know, correct for some of these uh, mistakes and like really make um, Ethereum be a platform that uh, you know, like we can really be architecturally proud of in every way. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing. So before we wrap up and come to the next point on our closing ceremony agenda, mm. is you have a room full of hackers. Mm. Is there anything else you would want to share with them today? Mm. <laughs> I don't know, I'm, sure, I'm, sure. I'm trying to think what, uh, what's to share, right? Because uh, like, I feel like there's a lot of really important things that I yeah, try to keep uh, you know, like mentioning and talking about, but like I'm actually becoming more and more impressed by like the speed at which some of those lessons get accepted, right? Like I, yeah, you know, like I've talked about the importance of uh, you know zk yeah, identity and reputation primitives and like zk voting, and there's like the first group that I talked to was literally doing zk voting. I yeah, you know talk like I keep talking about ZooPass and. Uh, I mean, it's sometimes frustrating because, um, like, you know, you have people who are like, oh, you know, Vitalik is pie in the sky and he's technical and he doesn't talk about applications. And then, I, yeah, you know, like they, they don't even realize that ZooPass exists. Um, but, uh, I mean, then, but then, you know, here it's like, oh, you know, people actually care about ZPass and, uh, you know, people actually are trying to use it. And uh, like people are really trying to like build end use cases on it, and uh, you know people don't mind that like Zupass does not have an associated token that can like make their uh, you know like bags go up by fifty thousand percent. Like no, you know it's uh, you know it's Zupass. Come on, like it's uh, it's doing the things that we care about. I'm like let's actually use it. Um, so. I think like that kind of uh, spirit from I mean, like both the yeah, organizers and the yeah, hackers is uh, something that uh, really impresses me. I think uh, I mean if I had to say one thing, I think uh, one thing that I would love to see more in Ethereum is uh, like I, I want to see more diverse participation, not just at like research and not just at dev, but at uh, I guess what you could call the idea layer, like the uh, the layer of like actually trying to figure you know, like ask and answer the questions of like you know what is Ethereum for, what should the goals of uh, Ethereum's uh, next five hard forks be, um, you know like what kinds of technical trade offs should it make. What direction should the application ecosystem um, go? You know, like how do we actually turn our current kind of like baby zk identity ecosystem into something that actually becomes a really significant part of the world that actually helps people? How do we actually, yeah, you know, get Berlin to uh, you know like do um, you know like Ethereum Kids 2.0 and like actually yeah you know like have uh, you know like, like not just cash but like actually yeah you know like good uh, uh, digital cash and uh, you know ideally with privacy built in and like ask uh, you know like the questions all at the uh, even at some of those uh, deeper layers and like be willing to participate in uh, that in that ecosystem and like think about those things and uh, you know if you have thoughts then um, you know say them and uh, ideally uh, you know like be properly cypherpunk and if you have things to say publish them on e on uh, ENS and IPFS yeah. that was a joke but you should actually do it <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah. Wonderful. With that, thank you. Say thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Your time thank, thank you. Guys. Big round of applause for Vitalik. Thank you. 
I hope this was a nice surprise for you. We did not announce this on purpose so that people who are here anyways can, yeah, have a little nice surprise. Um, alrighty, with that, we are actually moving to the part which I think many, many of you are waiting for, announcing the winners. And yes, woo woo woo. Um, we are doing this as we usually do it, which means we will now share the stage with judges who have spent all morning um, reviewing your amazing uh, submissions. And these judges will then, um, yeah, walk us through the winners of the respective categories. And probably a lot of hacking teams are here. If you are a winning team, I'm going to explain this process now uh, one time so that we're all clear. Basically, the judge comes up, the judge explains a little bit what they um, reviewed and what they were impressed about, etc. And then they will reveal the winner, so the first place. And we also have the second and the third place on the slide as well for a big shout out and uh, just for the fame, obviously. But then as the winning team, you can make yourself ready to come on stage and to uh, collect your reward and also be ready and prepared to have like a one or two super short minute uh, description of what your project does. And um, if you want to share anything else, also share that. You don't need to bring your laptop. You don't need to plug anything in. You just share basically what you hacked on, what's your project, what, do, what it does, etc. And with that... Yes. I'd say let's give it up for our wonderful Helena to talk about the Meta Award. Thank you. Hello. Okay. So the Meta Award was a new award we introduced um, to help us improve the East Berlin experience. Um, it was very tough. We had some really excellent submissions. So a huge thank you to every single one of you who hacked on this this weekend. So with that, um, oh, <laughs> I'll announce our top three. So in third place, we have Zoomit, which um, we really felt has the potential to become an important social networking app for the next edition of East Berlin. In second place, we have an amazing quadratic voting system, Zukofi. Congrats. And in first place, congratulations to Zcal. I'll let him tell you what it was about. Um, so with the prizes, uh, we just we kind of made a little decision um, because Zcal is a one-man band. We've decided to split up the DevCon ticket, so of course he gets one. And then we're going to give two to the runners-up, two each to the runners-up. So yeah, so come on stage. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Holy shit. Um, uh, I'm just happy to have shipped something, honestly. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so this, this idea is like we all kind of guiltily use centralized services and GCAL is one of them, uh, right? And there's reasons for that, like there's lock-in effects and so on, but there's also like increasingly nasty implications of, of uh, of allowing this to continue. If we all decided in this room to like jump off of, you know, like sort sort of Google Calendar dependence, it might work, but I think it takes a kind of softer way to, to help communities move off it. So this is I think it's a pretty um, simple idea. Um, for communities where we want to subscribe to events, um, it's a simple uh, spelt kit calendar. You can subscribe to feeds but it's proxying any kind of calendar backend. So you can let the organizers keep things on Google Calendar because they're busy and it works for them. And you can let all the other users just access a proxied system. And you know, and then it sorts out all these problems like, hey, are you on the Jitsi? No, I'm on the Google Meet. You sent me a Google Meet link and then we all like go, uh, Google. Um, 
you know, and stuff like that. And then it adds a semaphore on top of that. So it allows anonymous usage because once you prove you're in the group, uh, you get to see the calendar, you can RSVP, or you can just add to calendar, right? So using, using standards. Um, that, that's it. And it, it started because I just went to Ligi and I'm like, what is bugging you right now? Um, that like you're like scratching your head like we could have done this from last year and we didn't and uh, um, and I also yeah I could just see like yeah a lot of Web3 communities still kind of using Google Calendar and I was like okay let's let's do this so yeah I hope I didn't take too long sorry thank you so much thank you so much and congratulations <laughs> with that. Um, we uh, go into our main track awards and we start with uh, defensive tooling, um, which Garrett will be. No. <laughs> no, you just be yourself. Hi, everyone. Super exciting to present that. But first of all, thank you so much for the ETH Berlin organizing team. You've done a fantastic work. Thank you to all the other judges. Yes. Yeah, I'm not going to make that too long. It was a really tough choice, and we had a hard time. We had really great presentations. Thank you to all the hackers, uh, but we had to make a decision, and the three that stands out are here. Number three, Chainmail. <laughs> Applause. <laughs> ZK Tripster, number two. And the winner, Shadowlings. <laughs> yeah, so a few words until they come on stage. So they allow us, hopefully we're going to all be using this very soon, to generate unique and disposable deposit addresses on Ethereum using ZK Proof to remotely pay for gas. Um, in the smart accounts with EIP 3074 and Nix method to gaslessly operate shadow accounts. They will tell you more right now. Thank you, Richard and Nick. Hey. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, last time four years ago, was participating here, so I'm super happy to be here. Super awesome event. Thank you, everyone, for organizing this. Yes, how did we get there? Um, actually, we got inspired by the recent discussions around how to empower EOAs, right? Like, so 3074 and 7702. And we believed that, you know, we know Fluid Key, actually building on top of SAFE, and we're both working at SAFE. Um, and we said, hey, can 3074 improve this, right? Like, and how can we take it a step further? Because Privacy is cool, but if you have to sacrifice like that you can recover and that you can keep access and that you have to remember a lot of secrets that like that we don't want this sacrifice. Like we want both, we want privacy, we want to have recoverability, and this is basically what we see also with smart accounts, a lot of cool recoverability solutions coming up based on a lot of different tooling, pass keys and other stuff. And we wanted to bring this together, and that's where we then built something based on 3074, 4337, and zero knowledge proofs. It was a lot of fun. We learned a lot of stuff about zero knowledge proofs. We had to, we wrote our own circuits um, um, with Socrates and tried to build, the, like, had the full stack with contracts and UI. And yes, and we hope that these things bring us into a place where we, as Vitalik said, right, like we have to marry this, the advantages of blockchain and bring also privacy into it because people do value privacy. Thank you so much. Thank awesome. You. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, next up, we have the Freedom to Transact Award. And I forgot my phone here. Um, who is the app? Ah. Left there he is already. Okay, we have Left Terrace to present that to us. A big round of applause to Left Terrace. Hey, all. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, good. So, um, this is uh, a very, very important topic, and uh, especially with the recent um, uh, Tornado Cast uh, indictment, this, uh, to my mind, is probably the most important track in the entire hackathon. Um, I think I speak for all the judges on this track that it was very difficult because we had very, very, very good quality uh, uh, submissions. 
So um, everybody who submitted, uh, you done a very, very, very good job, and you should really be proud of it and uh, continue your work uh, even if you didn't make it into the top three. With that said, uh, these are the three top projects. Um, one that speaks for me is the number three a lot because it's uh, trying to create local first versions of all DeFi um, applications, Rage Against the EU. Number two, CypherSmith, they were using the ERC 5564, I'm really bad with this, the SADO uh, addresses uh, to allow for private transfers. And uh, number one, the, the winners is inclusion bribes that they are using a system that I guess they will explain themselves um, in order to fight censorship at the builder level, basically bribing people to not censor. And so with that said, the, let's welcome our winners from inclusion bribes to explain. Thank you so much. Uh, so my teammate had to catch a train, so unfortunately he couldn't be here. Oh, I'll keep it for him. Um, so we made inclusion bribes, and we're out here uh, fixing corrupt policy with even more corruption with bribes. <laughs> so the way inclusion bribes works is that it allows developers that have their contracts censored uh, to allow them to create a bribe that is basically uh, creates a back-running opportunity for MEV searchers to give them uh, a reward token like WETH or uh, DAI, for instance. So this creates a back-running opportunity uh, through our proxy contract, which forces the MEV searcher uh, to call the censored contract in order to get the reward. And uh, whatever the searcher gets his reward, a bidding war will start, and that bidding will, war will create more valuable blocks for the builders. And these builders will be forced to create uncensored blocks. Because currently, relayer censors, but also builder censor. So it's time to make uh, these given incentives for builders to stop censoring, basically. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations again. Awesome. Thank you so much. And congratulations. Next up, we have the social technologies track. And that will be presented by Dennison. Dennison. We Ooh. welcome him on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, so uh, we were really excited to judge these projects. Uh, earlier, Vitalik said something about how there's some ideas that he has that just sort of like catch in the ecosystem really quickly in a way that he doesn't expect. And one of the things he had mentioned was ZooPass. Uh, and judging today, we found an overwhelming number of the projects actually built on ZooPass. So they took this idea uh, around privacy that came out of an idea that Vitalik had been speaking about, and they actually were coming up with really incredible different use cases that were very uh, exciting. So, I don't know if we can go to, do I control the next slide? Okay. So, uh, the winner was Zoo Git Proofs, uh, second place was ZK Twitter, and third was Voto. Uh, but what was really exciting here, <laughs> yes, congratulations everyone. In these examples, they used, uh, for, for the winner, they used ZooPass so that you could create um, identities in discourse to anonymously be able to um, speak about issues while using ZooPass to actually attest to your relevance of the subject. So for example, you could get a badge that would say uh, Ethereum Core contributor, so you could respond to people in a public format without revealing your identity, yet be able to share your reputation. Right? So you can give an anonymous comment and people would know, oh, this person actually has some sort of bearing in what they're speaking about. Um, the other projects likewise use ZooPass as well to integrate um, for voting and creating like a social feed. It was just really exciting to see how these new primitives can be put together. So thank you very much. And is Zoo Get Proofs coming up? Yeah. Come on up, Zoo Get Proofs. Thank you. Congratulations. Congrats, guys. Maybe you want to say a few words as well? 
Uh, yes, seems like we have to. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, definitely happy to be here at EAT Berlin, but at the stage as well. Um, this has been a teamwork from the start, so I, I'm Belma. I want to introduce also my colleagues, Marin and Philip, and we are team uh, Zusammen. And this, this weekend we worked on, on a project that should enable um, anonymous feedback and um, private discussions, uh, but with credibility. So what does it mean? Uh, and what we did is basically indexing GitHub contributions, so technical contributions to the code base uh, that would give kind of uh, proofs, badges, to discourse forums, the ones that are used by Ethereum magicians, ENS DAO, other governance-related uh, DAOs. And, um, what the user do, do do is log in with uh, Zupas. They will connect with, with our basically both backend and front end, um, authorize like the, their GitHub, get the proofs and get the badges on, on the discourse. Like for example, if you are um, building client implementations and you're, you can get a badge like Ethereum core contributor or you are EIP writer or something like that. So this can be very granular, very flexible, but the point is once you're kind of um, writing that post as an, as an anon, um, you can write whatever you want for whatever reasons you want because you do want to stay private and it will say like, okay, this is written by Ethereum core contributor. So it, it means something. Um, so yeah, hopefully to see it one day in production, I guess. That sounds really useful. Congrats. And with that, um, our last track award is the infrastructure track. Um, Billy, I guess. Hello, hello, hello. So infrastructure was a really fun path to judge. It was really hard. There was amazing contributions along the entire way. Uh, the way the judging worked is that there was actually two groups of doing infrastructure. We came together and we were both pretty sure we knew who the winner was, but it was not clear once we got together. So the two winners, the first and second, were especially neck and neck. But besides that, I want to repeat, so many of the contributions were really ambitious, well done, creative, just well executed. But without further ado, I will announce the winners are first, R55, second, anti-correlation, and third, Voto. <laughs> Interesting to note, the first two were also beginning as blog posts from Vitalik. The anti-correlation is about correlated slashing. Uh, a lot of momentum and really great work contributed to this. R55 is uh, RISC-V VM uh, in parallel with the EVM that basically allows you to write smart contracts in Rust, Go, C++, and still deploy to the EVM. Just such a classic hackathon project. Really well done. Would love to invite them to the stage to give you a little bit more information. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, this project was made with uh, my colleagues uh, Lucas, Rodrigo, and Moritz, and I'm pretty brain dead. We haven't slept much, so I may say a bunch of nonsensical things. But I'll start by saying that execution environments are back. Um, I've been saying this for a couple of weeks, and actually Vitalik wrote a blog post recently about L2s kind of being new versions of execution environments, sort of. And that was the premise for this project, where L2s have a really golden opportunity to be what execution environments would or could have been. And the goal here is to write basically one execution environment that allows for RISC-V smart contracts to be deployed and, and executed next to EVM smart contracts. So it's not really a replacement, it's more putting it next to it. And what, we, what we've done is yeah, a lot of low-level hacking stuff. Um, it was a pretty technical project, and in the end, um, it culminates in a fork of REVM, the Rust um, EVM inter interpreter used by Reth. And this fork supports uh, native RISC-V contracts next to EVM, and then from the outside, there's no API changes, so, so from the outside, 
the users can deploy either EVM or RISC-V smart contracts, and there's no difference in the API. And in the end, you can just take Wrath, swap the RV implementation by RVM R55, and then you get RISC-V contracts out of the box. And why is that cool? Because we can actually compile Rust, pure Rust, to this architecture, and we can have very clean and pure Rust smart contracts out of the box with only a very tiny macro that we have to add. So I think this was a very elegant solution we found for this. And um, this enables literally millions of new developers to be onboarded into Ethereum um, with very little extra effort, no extra tooling needed, no extra research needed. You can reuse a bunch of compiler, security, fuzzers, formal verification tooling, native testing in Rust and all these kind of things, um, basically for free. And yeah, it would be cool to have more VMs and more um, compilers and languages in L2s or maybe even the L1. So thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Wow. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you and congrats to all of the Track Award winners. With that, we move on to the Excellence Awards which will receive 5,000 die each, and we will start right in with the Best Smart Contracts Award. For that, I invite Hari to come up to the stage to talk a bit about the judging process there. Thank you. Um, just like the other judges said, judging this was very hard. There was a lot of very good submissions, and I'm overall very happy to see that the quality of engineering every year is going up. Um, there was a lot of really good submissions, and this was a difficult choice. Uh, and the winner is Catacombs. Um, so the reason we picked this is because writing smart contracts that involve a lot of interactivity and game mechanisms is, is a bit hard. And in my opinion, Ronan did a great job uh, finding the right balance of uh, bringing data on chain using a lot of uh, optimization tricks and more. A very fun code base and definitely deserves the best award for uh, smart contract excellence. Congratulations. Big round of applause. What did your project do? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, yeah, I, I did expect um, I was yeah, building this game basically. Um, it's like a um, Simple dungeon game. Um, you put money into it to get a character, and you navigate. Um, I mean, the cool, I think the cool part of it is that you have this kind of single player experience where you move around and the monster move around. But th this is computed like as you go, and then basically proven on the smart contract later. And then you can also have this multiplayer experience uh, with maybe the weapon that you collect with um, the monster that you fight and then you can attack the other player to get their money. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Next up is the Best Social Impact <laughs> Excellence Award, and Manu will present the winners. First of all, um, I wanted to say thanks to the ETH Berlin team. You guys kill it. Incredible, incredible experience here for everyone. Super excited to see that over 50 teams submitted for the best social impact, uh, which is really, really, really nice. Uh, it was very difficult for us to judge all of these incredible ideas. Uh, also super cool to see that there's a lot of new applications coming out. It's not tooling anymore. Now we're doing applications, so that's, that's super, super nice. And I want to call the winner. Um, they have an incredible app. I think it's called Carnation FM. Please come to the stage. Carnation FM team. Oh, they're running. Come over. Yeah, join, join, join. So the first thing I got to learn during hacking on this is I talk a lot. 
And not everyone likes a lot of talking, but we did way more than just talking. Except the first day, we did a lot of talking. We had a lot of struggles figuring out where we got to go. <laughs> We're very strong people, but I guess that makes the social impact even more important to us as well. We have all very much different opinions. Wanted to do something with music. Yeah, we ran, so a little bit of... <laughs> <coughs> but in the end, what Carnation really does is it builds a live decentralized broadcast which allows everyone to play a song. It allows people to send in a song, no matter who you are, where you are, and it's a social impact as music collects us all together. But that's just fun. And they made that very clear to me too. <laughs> and that's why we have a subsonic encryption system where you can have any WAV file for people not that into musical tech. It's basically a high quality audio file that can carry a lot of data. And you code under the frequencies or with white noise, depending on the system. And suddenly you have a whole radio with hidden messages that can only be decrypted if you have a public key and know when it's gonna hide or play. So you have a live stream 24 seven under a facade of a little radio, but who knows what's actually playing? And who knows what we will be playing because we like breaks, we like parties, we like music more and more. So maybe we'll hear you soon on Carnation FM. Oh, congratulations. Thank you so much. That sounds great. Congrats. Okay, we move on to the next award. Best user experience. And for that, I invite Nuno up to the stage. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone. And congrats to all the hackers. Congrats to the organization. Wonderful event. I have the pleasure to announce the best uh, user experience. It's really great to have design on stage, to have thinking about the end user, something that we lack on the space. So I'm really happy to announce the winner. And the winner is Frostcree Recovery. Woo! Okay, I didn't expect it. I was about to leave. Okay, the, the idea behind Trusty Key Recovery, are you all familiar with social recovery? Can I get a raise of hands? Who actually uses it? Okay, one person. Why? Because the people that you trust usually don't have experience in crypto or don't have a wallet, so you fall back into regular C trace breakup. So Trust Key Recovery gives anyone you don't know or anyone you know that don't have a wallet a private and public key pair generated with WebAuthn. WebAuthn is pass keys. Uh, everyone have it on their phone. And it has an extension to store private information inside the credential. So if you, do, if you store a private key, Ethereum private key, inside the credential, then you basically have an Ethereum account. And you're able to add them as a guardian. Now, that wallet never needs to be funded. It never needs to be connected through RPC nodes. And you can add as many recovery contacts as possible, as long as you know them. Let's say you add five, and you trust three of them at least to have their phone at some point in time. Um, that's it. That was the pitch. That's incredible. Thank, thank you, and congratulations. <laughs> and with that, um, we, are, we have won a special agenda item, because you cannot only win the hackathon, but also win a treasure hunt, and for that I would like to uh, invite our friends from the Social Distortion Protocol to stage to um, talk about this a little bit. Thank you. We are uh, Social Distortion Protocol, or SDP. Um, I am um, actually from Daedalus Industries, but uh, so this treasure hunt had a secret Daedalus participation, also SDP. And the reason I'm talking is because I was selected by our speaker delegation protocol, SDP. The treasure on today, um, here's some stats. Um, we had over 200 wallets join right away. It's really nice for us to see such high participation because primarily we consider ourselves a denial of service attack on this hackathon. So the more people we get snared, the more teams lose uh, uh, hackers to the game, the happier we feel. So thank you for everyone who got caught, who got stuck. Um, and um, 
Yeah, thank you all for playing. It's really rewarding for us to see people come up and tell us they had fun. Some people also finished. Um, here Woo! they are, our winners. <laughs> now, we would like to award our winners a special prize. Um, we have Amanda. If you know Amanda from the game, uh, she's here. She will award the prizes. And um, you three, would you please come up on stage to receive your prizes? You know who you are. Come on. And um, yeah, come on. I should say it's a lot of work. Hey, setting up one of these games, and we're constantly fixing things and and. Um, making puzzles, deploying them while you're already playing. And we have this uh, rule that if anyone ever catches up to us as we're setting up the games, if the player's fast and catches up to us, they are condemned to join the team. So our winner will be joining us on the next treasure hunt in Bangkok, and I hope you will all be there as well as players. So round of applause for the winners. <laughs> Yeah, all right, well, so, yes, feedback, what do you thought? You can happily tell us about the best puzzle and most annoying puzzle. Um, yeah, first of all, it was like really fun to play, and uh, yeah, I hope you're gonna go on with this, and thank you so much for creating. I think the most fun was like the piano, it took like us to, to the, yeah, no, the, when you have to guess the melody. Yeah, thanks so much. You're welcome. Do you wanna say a word? Yeah, I think the piano one was also pretty cool. And uh, I think the most annoying one was probably the ball pit because there was literally one in like two million balls. So it was almost impossible to find. Point taken. So. <laughs> Please give us your feedback afterwards. Um, where we, you know, we depend on it. Nico will be Presenting. Yeah, one last detail. Um, so we have planned uh, NFT prices uh, for this uh, treasure hunt. This is fine art, but you don't see it clearly here because there are no animations. Uh, but if you head to the marketplace, you would probably see them. And basically, there is a gold uh, badge, silver badge, bronze badge for first, second, and third. Investigator badge for whoever finished all the side quests, meaning one person, and anyone else uh, that finished the treasure hunt, uh, we get a finisher back, mm, badge. Uh, this NFT uh, stands on a very solid floor price of zero ether. It's actually, the gold one is not being given to the first one that finished the last puzzle, but the first one that claimed it. So there is a bit of difference between the previous rank and this one, but uh, yeah, enjoy the NFTs. And um, anyone who has an NFT or the right to claim one, uh, join us for some bubbly outside and we'll drink together and talk. Yes. Please come join us. Thank, thank you, um, Social Distortion Protocol um, with your treasure hunt. It is uh, always incredible to see what people build if you give them a blank, blank sheet of event. Yeah. That. And with that, we really now have to quickly wrap this up. You've been sitting here for way too long already, and I admire your patience. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Um, a few operational things. Winners, please do find the Zupas team after the ceremony at the AV booth, so here in the back. Um, because you will um, get a special credential, and with that you can then generate a proof of win at ETH Berlin, which we will need to hand out the prizes to you. Um, also, remaining swag. We have our swag station set up in the tent, and now everything is up for grabs. So if you want to take a second T-shirt for a friend or a colleague, uh, feel free to do so. They are really comfy, they are really nice. I can highly recommend um, also the bags, so feel free. And the posters are available now as well. Thank you for the reminder. So yes, check out the swag station for everything that's still there. Also, we have uh, one more little thing that we want to pamper you with. Uh, we have some drinks and snacks um, available in the restaurant. Feel free to mingle for one more hour, have fun, enjoy some music, etc. The venue will be open until 8 p.m. Um, we also have the lost and found in the tent. 
and for everybody who is sticking around in Berlin, there is a hack and tell on Tuesday in the sea base. And I think we would love to see some of the winning projects there as well. So feel free to come by uh, or to talk to Ligi for more information. And lastly, at 8 p.m. you have to leave this venue, but you can immediately walk cr just across uh, the canal to the Eden uh, venue where our after party will be held. Uh, your East Berlin wristband gets you access. Um, in the swag bag there is a plus one uh, uh, wristband if you need to bring a friend or want to bring a friend. Again, big thank you to Tux and uh, Entropy for organizing it and come early if you want to get guaranteed entry. Exactly, and if you didn't get enough hacking this weekend yet, I can highly recommend you to check out ETH Prague. This is happening next weekend, and it's also a conference and hackathon happening from May th uh, 31st to June 2nd. Check out ethprague.com for more info, and you can even take the train conveniently from Berlin. So if you fancy another hack next weekend, make sure to check this one out. With that, um, you can now finally vote uh, on zupol.org on our Hackers Choice Award, which is the last remaining award that everyone can win who submitted a project at East Berlin. And please don't leave yet because we want to say thank you to all the people who have made this event very nice. Yeah, thank you to the East Berlin core team. Please all come up to the stage. We can do a group photo. Yes, come on, come on. And also to our volunteers, please, volunteers, come up as well. Volunteers, volunteers, volunteers. Please, volunteers, come up stage. Thank you all, thank you all. Woo -hoo. Yes. 60 of the volunteers, please come to stage. We still have two minutes until the drinks open, so come up stage. Hurry. All, all 60 volunteers. Maybe some of them left already. We could not do it without you. Thank you so, so much. This was such a wonderful, amazing weekend. We can now celebrate it all together in the restaurant area and tent. And with that, I'd say, Again, thank you and enjoy the music, the snacks and the drinks and see you hopefully um, in a few years. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs>